Hey everybody, I'm Deb Wyant, Administrative Director for Markwood Music and Electrifier Strings. I'm so excited to bring you the experts of the string education world led by Emmy Award winning composer and Juilliard trained education advocate, Mark Wood. Our topic today is the 21st century orchestra, the next 10 years. So please let us know that you've joined us today. Type in your questions in the chat box. We'll be answering questions in between each person as we go. Um, so I'll be monitoring that and be able to ask your questions. Um, so, um, and one other thing, please email me at deb at markwoodmusic.com if you would like more information about our presenters and the great things they're doing. Um, <laughs> uh, so to start this off, Mark Wood. Ba -da 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 -da. Ba -da 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 -da. I knew I should have gotten theme music prepared. Hello, the world. We are so, so proud to be able to do this technology right at this point. We did the session at ASTA National about two months ago to great success. And I felt it was so important for us to share with the entire world and community of our great, great orchestra directors who are keeping the boat afloat and keeping their students engaged during this challenging time. This is just a pause button, my friends. Do not worry. We will back to being doing concerts. We will be in classrooms. We'll be working together with our great music programs. So while we're taking advantage of this pause, we do want to have you think and uh, respond to us with any kind of questions and thoughts. Uh, the panel that I put together are truly the great, great leaders and dear friends of mine, and I can't thank them enough for participating. But what I do want to start with is a, the a new article on uh, teaching music. And uh, what we are dealing with is a, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years is the message of our orchestra programs. The people on this panel and everybody around the world already know the power of, actually, I have it right here the power of the bow and uh, the expressiveness and the technical aspects of it and the beauty and the composers that have worked with stringed instruments from 400 years ago to today is astounding. So we sit on the great shoulders of our great, great classical heritage and that will never change because we always must be able to play in tune and play rhythmically accurate and have our technique at the highest level possible to express ourselves. So we are not pushing that aside on any way for the next 10 to 20 years, but we are doing is we're refreshing the way we think about strings to our communities from parents to teachers, to students, to administrators. They need to hear and feel that the orchestra programs are vibrant, interesting, invigorating, creative, imaginative, and traditional. All of these things can happen. We wanna combine the great traditional pedagogy with a modern pedagogy and partner them as a marriage. And I really believe that that is our future. Now the uh, article that is in Teaching Music, which just came out in April, was an eye opener. Uh, we've all felt that it's a little bit of an uphill battle and it's getting more and more challenging the last 20 years, but to see it in print and these statistics and data are actually from 10 years ago. So if you can imagine the last 10 years hasn't been a flourishing growth period for our string programs as much as we would like. So the results of the current study indicate that 24% of high school class of 2013 enrolled in at least one ensemble course in high school years. So this data is based on high school years and it's based on the percentage of students who participate in the arts and the music program specifically. So apparently 24%, which is really low, shame on everybody, we, sh uh, we should have at least 50 to 70% of kids in our music programs, whether it's choir, band, or orchestra. But as we get deeper into the uh, data, it is clear that the current study that choir at 13% is the most popular choice in schools. Obviously you don't have to rent an instrument, You're, it's just your voice, and it's a much different experience. Um, what we have is band is at 11%. And then unfortunately, we get to what orchestra percentage, which is a tiny, minuscule 2% of our high school programs 
are part of our orchestra programs, which is very, very unacceptable to me. And I feel that right at this moment, as we pause for a second, we really need to grow. Um, orchestra, while often grouped together with other ensembles, lags behind the other ensembles in terms of uptake. Orchestra students make up only a small portion of the students, less than guitar and keyboards. That's unacceptable to, uh, unacceptable to me. Um, and the last part of this great article is the wind up last paragraph, which is to attract population of students. A new population of students to the study of music may require more sufficient efforts to offer courses focused on completely different manifestations of musical experiences, such as songwriting and composition. Now, the guitar classes and, and um, vocals, sometimes it's a little bit easier to implement that. But I believe, like my panel does, is that any type of experience, when you implement it for a student, whether they play saxophone, violin, or guitar, they will respond to some invigorating experience to challenge them. So I'm really, really hopeful that we're gonna take this data and catapult it uh, to the future. So I'm hopeful that that will do it. And by messaging and by the three additional elements incorporated with our traditional orchestra programs, improvising, technology and global styles critically important from indian music to scottish music to american music and vivaldi it all works together because my biggest philosophy has always been when i talk to the students i say you are not a viola player you're not a cello player you are a musician and the more we can elevate the sense of being a musician first our ears will be bigger and more importantly, we can interact with other non-symphonic instruments like guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards, and singing, and really integrate not only with a viola section or cello section doing a Brahms symphony, but we also, after school, have our own band or our own experience that has nothing to do with orchestra that we had during the day. Having these augmented experiences will absolutely allow this to grow and be unhinged so that the future we are out of that two percent and i'm going for 50 percent. how about you guys so uh i i, I want to thank everybody uh to join me um i am going to first hand over the mantle to one of my dear colleagues uh julie lyon lieberman who is incredible gosh 40 plus years how, on the helm and the first person to really say, hey, wait a second, everybody, jazz violin, uh, Leroy Jenkins. Uh, God, there are so many players that Julie Lieberman, right, David, that Julie Lieberman turned us on to that we weren't even aware of. She did this concert at Symphony Space that I'll never forget when I was a kid and I walked in and I saw one violin player after another doing the most unique stuff. So, Julie, we bow down to you. <laughs> well, I bow back. <laughs> Thank you. You've done amazing things, Mark. It's been wonderful to watch you develop an incredible um, inspirational movement in the world. And um, I want to go back to the statistics you just cited and point out that choruses um, in schools get to sing contemporary music along with traditional band students get to play contemporary music along with traditional. It's the string programs that have been lagging behind and I think that that reflects in this percentage. Now, um, if we cross compare, let's say the average string student in uh, middle school through high school, who most of whom stop playing by the time they leave for college with fiddlers not just throughout this country, but worldwide. They play together every week as a part of a community experience, whether it's Scandinavian, old time fiddling, bluegrass, Irish, you name the style, Western swing. They get together non-judgmentally, not like, oh, I'm better because I sit in the first chair or any of the competition that unfortunately we have built into Western canon. Uh, these fiddlers, embrace one another, help one another play better. 
Um, this has been going on for centuries and continues to this day, though now we're all online. And if you go to, let's say, um, uh, Fiddle Hell, yes, that's the name of the program, <laughs> uh, they're now, they've now switched over on their Facebook page to all kinds of live jam sessions where folks, yes, they're at home, but they get still to participate and be a part of this experience. Now, if we go to some of the, for those of you who believe that Western canon is the only way to achieve a high level of technique, well, technique isn't just about physical muscle moves. It's about what happens in the musical brain and how we use our ears. And um, I can very quickly, I promise I won't take five hours, <laughs> give you a comparison between Western Canon's emphasis in ear training on um, recognizing pitch and being able to notate it or duplicate it on your instrument and recognizing rhythmic patterns and being able to notate them and duplicate them on our instruments. Now we move over to um, the musical imagination of the world. And what does that ask of our ears? Well, it asks us to lock in time increments, like the way a chef can have a two minute egg over here and a five minute something and a 15 minute something without looking at the clock. That enables us to improvise. It enables us to create variations on melodies. And for classical students who want to compose, they can actually write a harmony part for a piece of music from centuries ago but they also need to be able to track time increments. Then there's rhythmic subtext, being able to hear the whole time you're playing and bring that into your bow stroke. Boom, the players that play in these different styles, they're hearing a rhythmic subtext the whole time they're playing so that they're able to bring that out on their instrument no matter what the melody or the improvisation or variation. Then we have ear training for ornamentation, being able to recognize the sounds of a style and be able to capture it, which can be very obvious, like a certain kind of trill or a turn, but it can be very subtle. Um, like where, where do you, you grow the note? In, in Western canon, we hit it on top, but in so many other styles, it creeps in someplace else, like Scandinavian is towards the end of the note. Um, we, if you listen to the language, you actually hear it in the vocal intonation and how that comes onto the instrument. Uh, vertical technique is a term that I created to describe the awareness of touch in the left hand. You don't have to worry about the right hand because the two motor cortices are connected. It will respond accordingly. That left hand has to be able to vary the depth into the string to be able to carry capture ghost notes and jazz, um, fluctuations within the phrase that we wouldn't learn through um, Western canon where things are, tend to be more symmetrical and more into the string and then soft and loud, but whole passages that way. But you, when you listen to other styles of music, if you haven't developed that listening capacity to take this in, you will turn everything you play into sounding like it's classical. And that's not where we want to go. We want to open our students' ears, open our, our ears. And then bow patterns, very different bow patterns for each style of music. The ability to hear when the bow changes direction and how many notes are grouped in a bow stroke and not just symmetrically, like three notes you play like ba, 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 but depending on the style, bo, bo, ba, bo, ba, ba, bo, bo, you know, it depends where it appears. All of this, develops our ears to a level that I gotta argue with you, I don't hear in classical training. I do a lot of string teacher training. When, when they go to play a style, it, everything is locked into their muscles according to Western canon training. So um, to finish this off, um, the, the, um, the important point is that if we're training artistry, Artistry comes from hearing something, audiating it inside, and being able to bring it out on the instrument, which can only happen if we introduce these different styles and new ways of listening. Thank you. Wow, Julie, awesome.
Awesome. Thank so you. well said. And I find that what you said about the nuances, right, the nuances of culture, similar to food, when you're eating Mexican food, whether you're eating European food, the food is very specific to that culture, which why we don't just eat one type of food, hopefully. We explore all different cultures. And again, yes, your, our pedagogy sh and must reflect that because it opens up diversity in our string programs. And that was another part of the article. Uh, obviously, a lot of African-American uh, students are, ve are unheard of in the classical world. Um, as far as the European uh, Caucasian uh, population. But uh, thank you, Julie, that was lovely. Thank you. thank you. Dr. David Wallace, oh my goodness, how did we get you on this one? Gosh darn. Well, it's not like I have any gigs right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you are busy and you're one of my favorite, favorite, favorite people all the way from Juilliard and working with the New York Philharmonic and you know, and you being the person who really bridges this beautiful world of Messiaen and Debussy and Brahms to Leroy Jenkins and Led Zeppelin and to the Beatles and to, uh, God, did you do a Poison song at camp once or what, what song did you do? Uh, yeah, I've, I've done plenty of other, <laughs> plenty of other questionable material by a certain perspective. Yes, and that's there. You see no walls. You see no boundaries. And and now with you heading at the Berkeley Strings, it is such an incredible moment for us. And thank you for joining us, David Wallace. Thank you, Mark. I, I really appreciate being here. It's also especially poignant to be following Julie Lieberman because I remember as a young college student, two of her books which really changed my life. One was you, you Are Your Instrument, which was all about playing without pain, using your, your mind-body as an integrated unit, and learning how to surpass all the damaging judgment that often comes with strings education or just learning a craft. And the other was improvising violin, which opened me to a whole world of creative people, many of whom I actually got to know or study with or work with. But, you know, I really, part of the reason I'm here and that I'm a professional musician to begin with was that I was a product of two things. One was the great public school orchestra programs in the state of Texas, and the other was the Texas contest fiddle tradition. And so I grew up bilingually. There weren't walls. And, you know, my father would take us to the Houston Symphony, and he would also listen to Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. So... I really didn't realize until I was in middle school that there were walls and musical walls and boundaries that were separating us, and it just seemed so senseless. And I think one of the nice things is we are living in a world where kids live life on YouTube, on Shuffle, on Search, and they have fewer walls than, you know, our generation who, who grew up with them. But one of the things that I just wanted to say is I think the 20th century orchestra programs were wonderful, but they were very good at teaching us one thing, how to play. It wasn't necessarily teaching us how to think like musicians or even how to analyze. I mean, I remember feeling cheated when I got to college and finding out what sonata form was because it's like, how come I, no one told me that? It would have made my life a lot easier to know this or understand that. Uh, but the other thing that I think was missing was simply tapping the creative abilities. And so I think the orchestra programs of the 21st century need to not only teach us how to play at a high level, but to also give students the skills to compose, to arrange, to produce. So that if you give the creative reins into the hands of the students, they will take that and run with it. And they will also be far more motivated to practice and learn and in some ways, it's also less work for the teachers. I mean, right now, I have an electric quartet of, of four electric string players and drummer as a Berkeley ensemble, and they're producing their own music videos and EPs, and they know way more about it than I do. So it's like, okay, here's your to-do list. Go do it. But, I mean, I think a lot of times there's fear from the teachers, like, well, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. I don't improvise. I'm not a producer. I don't do this. And that's okay. <laughs> You know, we, we all learn skills as we go, but the bottom line is sometimes all you need to do 
is give the students the permission to run with it and they'll figure it out. Or you can bring in an expert like Mark or someone in the, in the profession. I look at Bob Phillips, who was a master of saying, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this, but you know what? I'm bringing in this person to do that, that person to do that. And the result was you have students who have gone on to do so many different things that are so far beyond what any one person can do. And at Berkeley, I'm really in kind of a, a privileged position because I have a faculty of 20 string players who are good at multiple different things. And I have students who are coming in. I remember an ASTA convention where, where there was a presentation and Bob Phillips had actually said, he took me aside and he said, what you're doing is beautiful, but you know what? There will be a day when you are no longer a freak or an anomaly, but it's going to be the norm that people are coming to colleges fluent in more styles, pursuing more things. And I can tell you we're already there. A lot of times people are asking me, okay, with your students at Berkeley, how many of them are classical? How many of them are bluegrass? How many are jazz? And it's like, well, you know, the typical students coming in and they're an ace in their youth symphony and they're a Cape Breton champion fiddler or they're, they play in a klezmer band with their family. And so I think this polyglot musicianship that we've all dreamed of for many decades is already there, but we have to help it. The other plug that I want to make for the necessity of these things is that it totally opens up and resolves the conundrums of diversity, equity, and inclusion that have been talked about in classical music and in orchestral education for a long time. Because, and that's also one of the things that hurts a lot about the pandemic was this coming orchestra season, some major orchestras were actually making major strides in programming women composers and composers of color. And to have those steps taken and then to have uh, the season frozen hurts a lot. You know, and so we have to make up for that and we have to make sure that that d is not a, re a return to the old ways once we do get back to playing. But I can tell you this, if you do give the creative reins over to your students, that will change the problem because we all teach women, we all teach students of color, we all have students that represent so many parts of the population. One of the most beautiful manifestations of this is Eugene Friesen's orchestra at Berkeley, Berkeley World Strings, where most of the concerts are featuring music composed and arranged by the students. And again, the privilege of having an international community, we will have a Persian piece, a Canadian fiddle piece, a singing, standing cellist doing a Broadway number with jazz solos in the middle. And so that Every concert is different, and it's representative of who is in the orchestra that semester. And that's possible. And that's possible for us to do even at the elementary school and middle school level. And so I think let's take this opportunity that we're in to reset and to make it part of what we do. So David, wow. I have, a, I have a question for you. So for the teachers who are reluctant to let go of that control, what do you suggest? How could they start to do that? You know, because there's, there's one thing about jumping in. And so how would you suggest that they start? I think the first thing they need to do is examine what's behind my hesitation. Because reluctance is always there for a reason. And if it's fear that the kids are going to get out of hand or out of control, well, okay, let's look at ways we can maybe make sure that that doesn't happen. Or the other thing is, I mean, I've, I found very early in my years teaching in the middle schools that one of the biggest ways to deal with class clowns and troublemakers was to find ways to channel their need for attention by giving them power in constructive ways. And granted, you had to be very careful about that because we've all seen that backfire. But I remember one time giving a kid uh, basically, I was a visiting teaching artist, and there was a substitute teacher, and they were misbehaving. And I put a kid in charge of discipline, and I remember at one moment she looked at me and said, this is hard. I'm like, yep, it is, you know, and, and things calmed down. But, you know, if, if the reservations are, are coming from places that are questionable, 
you know, sometimes like, okay, someone might say, well, I don't really want to include hip hop because I just don't like it. And well, okay, maybe let's listen a little more. Let's learn a little more. Or let's look at what are the things you object to about hip hop. Because if there are, I mean, I have plenty of friends who are in hip hop who say, I want to change the paradigm. I do not want misogynist lyrics. I do not want things that I can't have my six-year-old kids listen to. There are things you can do to, to change things. But I would say the other thing is bring in a guest. Guests always have sparkle star power. You know, bring in an alumnus or alumna of your orchestra. I mean, that's another thing I want to say. If you're watching this and you're a product of great string programs, you need to go back and you need to visit and you need to teach and you need to talk. So I think those are some things that are helpful. The other thing I want to encourage, if you're not a member of the American String Teachers Association, join up because as a part of a community, people can give you the help, the support, the information. You can also get a mentor who can help you with these things. Um, and the other thing that I can say is the dividends are huge. We all know when our students are motivated, when they're excited, when they're engaged, they are productive and we don't have to ask them to practice or do their work, they just do it. So I think that's the other thing is to, to consider who are my specific students and what do they wanna do. And don't make assumptions because every group of kids will have opinions that may surprise you or desires that may surprise you. And you know what, if you've got a group of kids who are just excited for that they could be different and play Beethoven, after that, that's a that's good a win. David, thank you so much. And I do want to add, over the past 20 years of us all doing ASTA National, the one keynote speaker who stands out head and shoulders of everyone else was yours. About five years ago, guys, do you remember? And I hope that ASTA filmed yours. That was 10 years ago. I don't think they have oh. a film, but I do have a Zoom recording. I'll look it up and put it on YouTube. Oh. It sure. is the performance and your message was so resonant. But yes, that was 10 years ago. You would think that we would pull up from your great, great messaging, but it's getting, it's, it's challenging. That's why we all got to work together. And, and Dr. David Wallace, you are awesome. Love you to death. Um, another incredible, magnificent person, person, Dr. Bob Gillespie is with us. And uh, we want to congratulate again, Bob, for winning. It was a Paul Rowland Award, correct? Yes. C congratulations, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And we love having you here and working with you for many years with OSU. And correct me if I'm wrong, this year, this summer is going to be happening at OSU Summer Camp, uh, the summer teacher thing. But also, you are going to be at blossoming into all sorts of awesome stuff is that right oh yes we got we have lots uh going on i'm i'm gaining weight every day just a lot which <laughs> <laughs> is great thank you so much uh I, i'm honored to be here and bravo to all the teachers who are teaching in the schools you are the soldiers carrying out the message of our profession and just imagine the thousands of students whose lives you've touched with our great art form. Bravo to you. You have got a terrifically difficult job and I just say thank you so much. So my little contribution for today, I've been thinking about uh, how Deb said, how to engage, inspire, retain, and recruit students for the next generation of playing in the schools and playing string instruments beyond the schools as well. And I, so I've been really thinking about that. And for me, there's an underlying philosophy. And that is, and I'm gonna shock some people when I say this, but we are in the entertainment industry. That's where we are because of the culture we live in. And whether we should be in the entertainment industry or not, that's a different issue. But reality is we're in the entertainment business. 
Why do band programs attract so many students? They're in the entertainment business because of the marching band, okay, which is terrific. Why are choirs so large? One of the reasons, as one of our wonderful colleagues has already pointed out, you get to sing what you hear uh, today. And so why, why do people, 100,000 people, go to a Rolling Stones concert still at this point when they're in their 70s, <laughs> 80s, and they'll pay $100 to do that? It's because they're being entertained. And I think uh, our students need to be, we need to come at the culture and say, okay, I'm going to entertain you with my Vivaldi and my Mozart because I'm entertained with that. But that may not be where the client is at the moment. And so I try to get my students, my university students, to understand that when they're going into the profession, they're really going into the entertainment business at the moment. So I've been thinking about, okay, well, we're going to do that. So I've been thinking of practically four different ways of actually doing that. I get barraged, and I'm sure we all have, with questions from teachers. What, what do I do now? What do I do now? Because I'm online only. I, I got this summer and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Well, we think uh, that this is the first week in May. And if schools start up again in the fall, it probably will be sometime during the month of August. And so we've got May, June, and July. We've got actually 12, at least 12 weeks between now and then. So what can I do to prepare to engage, inspire, retain, and recruit students in this culture? So I've been thinking of uh, four different ways in 12 weeks we actually could do something to begin to move ahead in addition to what we're doing. So the first thing I'm, I'm thinking about is that if, if we all, myself included, spent at least one hour every day listening to what middle school students are listening to, um, get, get ourselves in their culture. And that may not be something we naturally want to do, but we're selling a valuable product to the client, and that's where the client is coming from. So if we just go online or we ask our students, hey, give me the top two tunes that you like at the moment. What do you think in the last year the top three songs are? And we force ourselves or we encourage ourselves to get in that culture by just, just listening. Uh, you know, we're in an aural field, so it should be pretty easy from that standpoint. So we just immerse ourselves for an hour. Is there such good things as pop music that's good? Yes. Is there such good things that is bad? Yes. Is there such good things as good classical music? Yes. Is there such examples of bad classical music? Yes, of course. So we just get ourselves in that culture as, as the first thing. And then the second thing I would suggest is that as much as you're able to, to support live non-classical performances in your community, and that you go to, we've got 12 weeks, you figure out, can I go to some performance somewhere, online, whatever, that's not gonna be classical for at least one time this week so that I hear it during the day while I'm listening and immersing, but then I also go and support the live people, whatever, who are not doing what I do, because I already enjoy what I want to do. I want to figure out something else. I want to figure out why are people playing that music and why are people showing up for that music? And yes, we're doing marketing, but why are they staying? Why are they paying money? Why are they drinking alcohol? Why they listen to those performances <laughs> and so forth, okay? So that we get ourselves to be able to do that. And then uh, the next thing I would suggest is that we spend as much time as we possibly can involved with technology. And it's the technology that brings music into the classroom. 
whatever that technology is. I'm not talking about how can I teach online and so forth. That's a different issue. I'm talking about technology that's going to interest my students and that they're going to teach me and we are together doing something like that so that we are immersing ourselves in the culture and just an entertainment culture. We're getting some tools and there's all sorts of places to go to get those tools that we didn't grow up with. And so we can broaden ourselves that way. And then it's terrific to bring in recognized composers and da 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 and so forth. But you know what, if we're in the entertainment culture, why not bring in the local guitarist who's playing at the Holiday Inn on Friday nights. Not going to cost a whole lot of money, that's for sure. And have them come in to the classroom and show what they do and help them become part of the teaching team because that may not be our background. But we don't have to wait to pay thousands of dollars. Well, I can't do this because I live in a small town and I don't have any resources. I bet the local guitar guy would love to come in. The local whatever folk be, uh, group of people together, the local whatever, and you've already been out there once per week. So you know something, you're, you're starting to get connected with the non-classical environment in your city. And therefore you've noticed, oh, hey, this person over here, I bet would relate really well to my students. And what, hey, could you come in and just teach us that one, four, five thing that you're doing. And, you know, we're gonna, we'll do something on top of it. And you teach us begin to teach the licks. And pretty soon, they're, they are an adjunct teacher to your program. And they bring others and others and others into your program. Isn't that cool? And it, would, it wouldn't cost hardly anything. Plus, the respect that that person would feel. Oh my God gosh, they're going to immediately go out to all their colleagues and say, oh my gosh, you know what's happening over here at this middle school? I was out there. I was a guest artist. Oh my gosh, this is this, you know, I actually had to, you know, take a shower and clean my hair for the first time. <laughs> I couldn't smoke in the middle of the presentation. I had to do it for an hour. So I worked myself up, you know, to be able to do that. But it was so cool. And that would, there's, that would be four practical ways, I think, in this entertainment field that we live in to help recruit, inspire, engage, and retain the current students. Can you imagine a, a kid going home who's had that experience and telling mom and dad, hey, well, you know what, you know what we did in orchestra today? So and so from such and such down the street came in and, and taught us how to do this and this and this. And now we're gonna do it as a part of what we're doing in our curriculum. I bet mom and dad would really pay attention a little bit more than what we are. So that's my two cents uh, for today. But once again, my hat is off tremendously to the people who are digging the ditches out there. You are the future of our generation, drawing kids in. And there's just some ideas that perhaps that we might all use, myself included. Bless you all. Thank you, Bob. That was beautiful. And I want to add to... And you're a treasure to us all for the many years that you've invested in leading us. It's so important. But what it, you brought up such a good point, getting the community vested in the schools, bringing in athletes, professional athletes, scientists, um, people like that. And the music world, the choirs, band, and orchestras benefit so much by having somebody new coming in because the community is really, sometimes they don't even know if they have an orchestra program and they don't really care. Let's get them to care. And thank you, Bob. That was beautifully said. Okay. Um, question. I have a, <laughs> I have yes. a question. Um, so Vicki wants to know about introducing elementary students. You know, you were talking about middle school and, and I know that you guys are middle school and high school teachers and uh, college, but how to introduce elementary students and beyond to hear the, the global styles and the different styles and really get them to listen to various things instead of just what they want to listen to. That's her question. So, sure. what do you think, Bob? 
gosh, the sky is the limit, okay? And li there's so many recordings, videos that, that you can use in your classroom and then find somebody locally who's really good at that particular thing that you want to add into the curriculum, whatever stuff. It would be the klezmer, you know, musician uh, down the road who's doing things and so forth. And then bring that. There's nothing like... Uh, who is an expert, somebody who lives how many miles out, out of town or something like that, you know, so you bring a new face into it and they introduce this and it could be done even at the very beginning. We're talking open strings if you want to do that, how long, how short, how you want to feather the note in that particular style in an open string and so forth. How do you put it within a D major scale? Well, in Klezmer, we don't use D major scales. Well, let's join their world, okay, and see what we can do in their world. That's where I would start. So would Great. you suggest that if if they, if it's like for the really young students who maybe don't have the um, the string the the playing ability yet or or reading notes or whatever, would you suggest that they play by ear and work on that oh, skill? Definitely, <laughs> yeah, de definitely right. We're gonna we're an oral art form. Somehow this visual thing got in the way, and it was simply because we wanted to duplicate exactly what some major composer did, which is a high. That's a wonderful thing. But we're in an oral art form. God knew that. That's why he gave us not one, but two ears. That's why we have them over here. He would have just given us one nose or one ear, you know, but he gave us two over here to be able to do that. And team up with your classroom music teacher, whoever that is. If that's the classroom teacher or you happen to have a general music specialist or something like that, they can be bringing all these styles and then you just build upon it. So kids can arrive with an ear. They may not know what to do on a stringed instrument. They may not know what this is different than this over here, but they've got a little background. What, when I was teaching in the schools, I really always wanted to have my best friend being that general music teacher because we're a team. We're not, we're not on different teams to lay the foundation. And Bob Phillips, you had a thought? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I used to do with the elementary kids all the time is we put on various styles, and this would even be within the first month or two. We just play the group. This is very Julie Lyon Liebernesque. Um, just play the groove on an open string. Just figure out what the groove is. You know, what's the fundamental rhythmic underpinning of the piece? Let them groove on the open string. Then maybe add a couple, you know, more than one open string. Hey, they can, but, but, the, but the idea is they don't have to have a ton of technique to be able to understand rhythm and groove. Right, and Bob, by the way, uh, this is the great Bob Phillips, who's an innovator, innovator with our uh, string pedagogy and our string world for many, many years. It's so great to see you, Bob. Um, actually, I'd love you to continue with your thought. Uh, you like, do you want me to do my thing here? Yeah, or? It's your, you do your <laughs> thing. Okay. All right. Well, as long as I'm here. Hi, everybody. Um, like, as with Bob Gillespie said, thank you so much, teachers, for, for uh, doing what you're doing right now with all the online learning. It's really exhausting. I know I have two daughters that are string teachers. And they live right by me, and, and it's very tiring what they're doing online. Um, I want to weigh in on a couple things, a um, couple of thoughts here. I'll riff off of some of my, my friends and, uh, and esteemed colleagues. That First of all, I have a, uh, three daughters, two of them are string teachers. One of them is a, a math teacher. She teaches AP statistics. And I can tell you some things I've learned about statistics. So one thing I want to say about the article that was read at the beginning, which is absolutely right, but remember that within individual schools, it's not 2%. If the problem is we have, we don't have, um, there's a much smaller percentage of schools that have orchestra programs. Within the schools that do have orchestra programs, that percentage is way higher. Oftentimes it rivals the band or the choir in terms of numbers. So where that statistic of 2% comes from is the kids that have zero access to strings. We're, we're having great success where we have string programs. But the one thing that is a, a bad statistic for everybody in this country, I don't care what you teach, choir, band, orchestra, guitar, whatever, we also start a lot more kids when we graduate. And that's the real problem, is that our attrition rate is not good, even in great programs, often. So we, that's something we have to work on, which all these things that people are talking about do it 
uh, do. So let me just throw in a couple of things here. First of all, I would throw out this thought. Stringed instruments are not a genre. Stringed instruments are not a genre. There's nothing about string instruments that says classical music is the only thing you can play. Our goal is to A, replace ourselves. We want kids to have so many skills and, 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 and we got to give them the keys to the car. That's why we do all the RL training and give them the technique and expose them to all these things so they can d direct their own learning. And can, that's what happens when you do that. You're, you've got, they're forming their own bands, they're creating their own groups and they take charge of their own music making and learning. And that's a good thing. I don't want to be the sage on the stage. I don't want to be the person on the podium that has to tell them when they're in and out of tune. I want them to learn to play in and out of, you know, play in tune. I want to teach them how to hear chord changes and let them decide. Because here's the other thing. No one, there is no genre of music in the world that appeals equally well to every person. Some kids are going to fall in love with rock and roll. Some are going to love hip hop. Some are going to love fiddle music. Some are going to love jazz, some classical, some all of it, and in different amounts. But our goal is why are we being the arbiters of what they get to learn and hear, right? I mean, that's sort of like saying, well, let's teach, um, let's teach English, let's teach literature. But the only thing we're going to expose them to is, is, you know, English literature and Shakespeare and whatever. Well, great. But what about, you know, literature from around the rest of the world? Shouldn't they be well-rounded? And I think they should. The other thing I think, um, I had, so what Bob suggested about bringing an artist, I did that for about 25 years. And I can tell you when you bring somebody like Mark Wood in, when you bring somebody like Julie Line Lieberman, we, Julie and I have done clinics before in, in places and, and, and David Wallace and who, whoever it is, it's magic. It's absolutely magic. It was referred, uh, I think David was a person that said that um, basically I didn't know anything, which is true. Um, I was a bass player. I, you know, one in five, I was good, but, but beyond that, you know, so I brought in really, really great players over a course of a lot of years. My students got to play with some of the greatest players in the world and their genres and styles. And I can tell you as much as that electrified the kids, no, uh, no pun there, Mark, but as much as that electrified the kids, it electrified the parents even more. I mean, the parents got so wound up about it, right? Because it's community involvement, it's community. And that's what Bob's talking about, Bob Gillespie, um, who, you know, I have the ultimate respect for. He's, he's my brother from another mother, along with Steve Benham. They're just great people. But, but, the, uh, but I would say this, he's absolutely right. It is about the entertainment value. It's about the show. That's what we do. And the music is that, okay? It's always been that. It's never been just strictly this high level art form. It's always been entertainment. And that's why we listen because, and the big thing I would say, um, if I had a message you know, for everybody out there in terms of jumping in, I would say a couple things. If they don't look and sound good, nothing else matters. You gotta help the kids look good and sound good. You gotta give them the skills so they can access any kind of music they want. So they don't have physical or aural limitations. You ex expand them as far as they, as they can go. But the other thing is they gotta have fun. We've gotta put more fun in, in music making. Look, there's too many burned out classical players and, and other styles too. But, there's, but, the, but the thing I would say about these variety of genres of music you bring Mark Wood in, I trust you, trust me, they are going to have fun, a ton of fun, <laughs> maybe more fun than you want, but they're going <laughs> to have fun, fun. <laughs> right? And so the, the point is, what motivates, what motivates kids? They want to sound good and they want to play a tune. They don't, they're not, they're less interested in playing, you know, uh, the inner uh, part to you know, whatever, uh, Mahler, you know, one or what, you know, the viola part. I mean, that can be fun later on. They can get to learn to like that. But at the beginning and in those middle stages, I think we push them too hard. We, we spend too much time on literacy. We spend too much time on repertoire development and not nearly enough time on music making and broadening their experience. And might our high school orchestras not be quite as, we maybe, Will we not have as many sort of of these super elite high school orchestras that are playing Mahler if you if you if the fundamental approach is different? 
probably, probably won't get to quite those levels because we won't spend as much time beating notes into kids. But what we're going to have is gener we have a lot more kids involved and generations of kids that are a lot more creative and play for their whole lifetime. Mark uh, O'Connor is famous for saying you, you teach a kid a fiddle tune and you got a fiddler for life. And there, there's, there's great truth in that. Um, and I'll just finish with this. I, I, I'm a good example. I'm, I'm, um, um, I'm retired a year ago and just a little bit ahead of Bob G and we're about the same age. I'm about to turn 67. So what am I doing in retirement? What's, what am I doing to have fun? Well, I'm taking mandolin lessons. And so this morning I got up and what did I practice? I practiced Bach G from the D minor partita. I practiced two Shoro tunes. I did a really cool Chris Thiele fiddle tune. Um, and I did a blues, I did some blues improvisation and I had a blast. Now they're really disparate, they're really different, but you know, everything fed on each other. It's amazing how when you get delve into Bach, you go, wow, he could have been a really good improviser. <laughs> I mean, you, know, there's a, you learn a lot, right? You see the transference. So the bottom line for me is I, I'm just, I'm just, these are very random thoughts, but in terms of recruiting, retention, all those things, we got to look good, sound good. We got to have more fun and expose them to more things and give them the keys to the car. The more you enable them to take charge of their own learning, the more excited they are because they can go in directions that really they find really interesting. Thank you, Bob. That was wonderful. And Bob, I want to add a great thing that Leonard Bernstein said is that we don't work music. We play. Let's go play. How interesting is that we use that word to do music. Let's not do music, let's play. So I think that's a really good message for you uh, to share with everybody. The, you know, it's the word fun, it, it, it can be misconstrued. We're not here to have fun, we're here to have work here. We're, we're, we've gotta be very serious here. That's one way of working, but the bottom line is that we need to play more much more playing. And another thing that I really thought you had a good point about is the marriage and partnership and collaborative efforts, collaboration between master musicians and teachers creates a winning classroom. I really believe that. We've seen that time and time again. It's an age old model, right? The apprenticeship model. And I can't be an expert in everything. I can't. Right. I can't. But I, I know I've got a lot of friends. I know a lot of people, as Bob suggests, that you can invite in. And you know, when you invite the artists in, oh my gosh, they, they really love it. And they have so much uh, fun and get so much out of it. And they love to give back because they spend a lifetime create, you know, improving their craft. Now they want to give back and say, look, I can help you. I can help you with shortcuts. Yep. You, don't have to take, you don't have to do the 20 years that I did. You can, we, I can help you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bob yep. Phillips. A great, great, great leader of our world and have fun playing the mandolin. So, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Question from Austin. And this could be for Bob. It can be for whoever wants to jump in here. Talking about um, eclectic music, talking about different music. Are we doing a disservice to students when we use only sheet music to teach those different styles of music? Um, absolutely. 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 We are too literacy focused. Literacy is important, just like literacy is important in uh, in acad you know in in, in um, English math anything whatever it is literacy is important but the reason we need literacy we have we we we've, we've let it get out of control the reason we need literacy is because as Bob uh, Gillespie I think suggested classical classical composers have written forms that are so long and intricate you can't, it's very difficult to memorize so we have to be literate in order to access that music. Whereas most musics of the world, the forms are more compact. And so there's other parts that are complex about them, but they can be learned and remembered orally. So to me, if I had to balance one against the other, I mean, I spend an inordinate amount of time in my program giving, you know, working on the kids with oral skills. I'd much rather they come in and say, uh, you know, learn, learn a piece faster orally than they do, you know, reading it um, because, because that translates into musical skills. We, we have a lot of people that, that read, but they're especially like in, in band and sometimes strings, but they're great bu button pushers. It doesn't translate into music always. So our learning is, is the key. 
Uh, Julie, did you have a thought? Um, yeah, there's there's a beautiful way to integrate this into your program. Um, you string teachers out there have tremendous time demands. Uh, when when we walk into a room, the first thing we do with our eyes is to look around for someone we know. It's the same thing for our ears. And when we bring together a group of students and they're each buried in their own parts, they're not listening to each other and they have no recognition to be able to listen to what the other sections are doing. So you can divide the orchestra up, have someone, not just the person in the first seat, please, have someone volunteer to teach a major theme from their part or a rhythmic um, phrase and teach the whole orchestra that by ear. It only takes a few minutes, but they've just come from using their eyes, using their eyes, using their eyes, and then they sit down and they use their eyes to make music. They're not listening. This turns the ears on, stimulates better listening and capturing melody and rhythm and all of that and um, doesn't take a lot of time. So, And Julie, suggest. thank you. And additionally, we cannot forget the power that our oral skills in music allow us to uh, navigate the world as non-musicians mm -hmm. and being sensitive and creative and thinking instead of waiting, oh wait, I gotta see this written down before I can function. Uh, I think that's a great, great point. Thank you, uh, Bob Phillips, you're a, a treasure, we adore you. Um, Steve Benham, Dr. Steve Benham in the house, man. International traveler, goes everywhere, helps people on every level. We love you. What do you have to say for yourself? Oh, thanks so much, <laughs> uh, Mark, for hosting this. I appreciate it. International travel not happening right now, for yeah. sure, though. Um, all things all been grounded, right? And uh, But what a great time this is. I'm just thinking about what... Okay, I'm grounded. What am I going to do while I'm grounded? Uh, I think about when I was young and I was grounded, you know, you always find some way to amuse yourself. So, um, you know, I'm watching YouTube videos and improving my skills on the electric bass, figuring out, oh, what do those guys do? Um, and so I've got some great teachers right now. That some of them are living, some of them are dead, just by watching, watching YouTube and figuring out what's going on. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I just want to thank you as well, Mark, for, for taking uh, this time to bring us together. Um, and the people in this room, I have such respect for. You've influenced me in so many ways. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, how do we learn and, and, and how do we, um, you know, fig retain and, and improve our skills? And I'm at that age now where I'm, I'm changing from learning from those who are older, you know, to learning from those who are younger. And it was not too long ago when I realized, okay, wait a second, it's impossible to know everything, right? You want, we want to know everything. And these young students, my students at Duquesne, they know so much that I do not know. Uh, when we switched to um, online format this semester, I stopped the class in its tracks and said, all right, what do we want to do? What do you want to do? And we actually redesigned the whole methods class together. What's important for you in this moment? What can we do together? And they brought in so many ideas uh, that I and, and technology that I even wasn't aware of. They said, well, we could do this with this program. I'm like, what program is that? Hang on. And, you know, and they, they had some ideas about doing those things. So don't be afraid to keep learning. And that's the, that's the common theme for everybody in this room, whether you've been in this business for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, or you're just starting out. And you look at people on the screen, they're diverse in terms of their ages and, and their experiences. Um, music yeah. teachers have been, hit, have been hit really hard right now. Uh, and I just want to say that, like Bob Gillespie said, thank you. You are heroes for your kids. And so many of us idolized our high school music teachers or musicians. Um, and you don't know until you get into the field how hard of work that is to, to, to be that position. And just when you kind of get your year going, all of a sudden, bam, this happens. So you're, you're doing your best. Don't try to be everything you can't be. Do what you can today. And also recognize, man, there's a lot of us that are grieving the loss of, of so much right now. And there's the reality of lost income. There's the reality of lost opportunity. But for me, it's the loss of community. It's the loss of being able to come together in a non-virtual world and this is great. I mean, I love Zoom, but it's the ability to come together and to be able to 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 make music together spontaneously and to to be able to do those things. Um, and that's hard. And I think that making music together might help us 
re-emerge from this isolation as well. This might be the healing thing that we can do is to make music and maybe it's the most life-giving, life-sustaining activity that we can do as we talk about what a life-sustaining business or activity is. That does not play down the medical world and what our heroes are doing there, uh, many of them risking their lives, uh, working with COVID patients and so on. And some of you have been through that as well, uh, the COVID, uh, horrible COVID disease. But for us, we've got to recognize that we as musicians can make life better. The number of friends I have on Facebook right now who are not professional musicians and are posting songs of themselves singing or making music just because they're processing the day is unbelievable. And we can't lose that. Um, some thoughts about where we're headed in the article that Mark referenced at the beginning. We keep talking about increasing diversity. My friends, diversity is here. Diversity is here. We're not going to look for diversity and uh, we can ignore diversity, but we do so at our peril. And diversity is much more than just race and gender, though those are uh, the essential uh, issues, but it's cultural diversity because even within any race or gender or ethnic group, there is a wide range of music and musical experiences. Um, you look at the music of America, oh, we're America. Well, white America, well, white America's got so much different music. Black America has wide ranges of music. So how do you get that? How do you get at that? You go where the music is being made and you have to go where the students are. You don't have to teach kids how to improvise. That's what they do from the beginning. How do they learn language? Well, they imitate what they hear about around them. And then they hear other people Im imitate words and they do the same thing. And, Sometimes their syntax is you know, messed up when they're three and four years old, but they're improvising in their, in their native language really early on. Why? Because they hear it all around them. So don't feel like you have to introduce your kids to certain music. They probably already know it. They're probably already hearing it and listening to it. You just got to figure out what that music is. And then for the parents, just have the music going all the time in the background. You can't stop kids from singing to the music when, it, when it's on in the background. Diverse styles, major, minor keys, different modes, different scales. When kids are young, their brains are like sponges. They have so many potential neural connections that they can, that they can make up through about age nine or 10. Those are the crucial years for learning music and musical styles. And so don't wait until they're nine or 10 to introduce that. Let that be a time that when it's fruitful and when you're investing that way. Um, you guys remember songs that you heard when you were a kid and people who are in their 80s and 90s, Alzheimer's patients, they remember songs from their youth. Why? Because they hear that those neural connections are being made. And the fun part of it, I'm going to put a scientific word on that, it's called dopamine, right? Dopamine is the fun drug. It's what our body produces that gives us pleasure and satisfaction. When we are making music, right, that's the dopamine side of it. And you know what dopamine does? Dopamine creates and strengthens the neural connection. Dopamine creates the insulation around every single neuron. It makes it stronger. So the more positive experiences that we have with music, the more diverse music that we have, the more dopamine that we get, and that's the right kind of drug. So I just want to really emphasize uh, that in, those, in, the, in this moment. Um, music is a community experience, right? And uh, the thing that Bob G alluded to, actually everybody's kind of touched on it, is these conversations and improvisation. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to come to this conversation only with the things I'm going to say. And it, all of a sudden he's like, okay, I've prepared my answers. Well, no one may even ask the question that, you're, that you prepared your answer to. When you come into a conversation, you're ready to, to dialogue, you're ready to converse, you're ready to learn something new, right? Listening is the most important skill in conversation, it's not talking. And you learn more by listening and then repeating back than you do by talking. So I would say, man, absolutely, um, absolutely let your kids uh, engage in that and let them listen. Uh, some interesting statistics right now. America has become more racially and ethnically diverse. In a mere 35 years, there will not be a single racial or ethnic majority in the United States. Immigration drives a lot of this, particularly from Latin America and Asia. In 2016, 16% of the U.S. population was foreign-born. You compare that to 1965 when only 5% was. 
Um, Asia has replaced Latin America as the biggest source of new immigrants. And what's happening in Latin America is that, especially between Mexico and the U.S., as Mexican economy has improved, there is a migration back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. every year. More Mexicans return to Mexico from the U.S. between 2009 and 2014 than came to the U.S. from Mexico. Our world, our borders there between Mexico and the U.S. are, are very... Um, they're very fluid and we should be able to take advantage of those cultural opportunities that are there. Uh, people who vote in 2020, I hope everybody will exercise that right. You'll be the most diverse voting population in U.S. history. 32 million Hispanics and 30 million Blacks are eligible to vote this year. That's a huge number. Um, we've got to look at millennials, but now we even have to look at Gen Z. This moment, this COVID moment, is a defining moment like 9-11 was. The kids who were born this year or are young right now will think differently about the world. And we have to understand that. Um, so how we use music to help them cope with that is really important. 43% of millennials are non-white. Generation Z, that's kids born 1996 to this year, are entering adulthood, 48% are racial or ethnic minorities. Only 36% of young people, however, ages 18 to 29, voted in the recent midterm elections. And we've got to change that. Um, student debt is a huge factor. Uh, shifting to vocational education is a huge, fa a huge factor. The American family is changing. One in six American kids now live in a blended family. So what do we do? Music is the new family. Music is the community. So many of my students at Duquesne tell me when they come in that music is about the, um, it becomes the family, the orchestra becomes the family, the strings become the family that they don't have at home. And it's a big, big deal. So I really want to, um, I, I want, I really want to emphasize that as well. Some other important things, we talk about diversity. This, and this is a big deal, you guys. One in six children born right now has some sort of identifiable diagnostic disability or learning challenge. That's one in six kids, right? How do we provide access, not just kids who are racially diverse, not just to kids who are ethnically diverse, but to kids who have disabilities? And it's more than just access. We've got to remember, kids who are diverse can bring a ton to what we do. They could change how we think. And um, boy, the other big factor, already anxiety and depression were huge issues for the younger generation. It's going to be more right now. And teachers, elementary teachers are talking about this. It's not in something that's, that's publicized, but I think we've all seen it and we're all maybe even struggling with it, right? Is, okay, when these kids come back to school, we're thinking about how do we keep them apart physically? And I'm thinking, they don't want to be apart physically. They want to be together, I'm, and the teachers are, elementary teachers are saying to me, how do we give these kids a sense of peace and a sense of calm? Elementary teachers love to create a learning atmosphere. If you've got kids who are fearful, can't leave their seats because they're, they're fearful of, of, of the disease, that's going to be a huge issue. Music helps us cope with, cope with that as well. So, um, you know, as we look at the world changing right now, I think we have an opportunity uh, that, to say music is essential. Don't think about how we don't do things, how we think about doing the things. I would say math is less essential right now to human survival than our mental and emotional and spiritual health. And music helps us uh, uh, kind of cross over those boundaries. And I know uh, Corey's here. He, I had him in with my class this last week um, at UK because he does he knows so much that I do not know. Like, okay, I'm gonna go to an expert, find someone under 30 who's doing the things that I wish I could do. And Corey's the guy, right? He came in and showed our students so many amazing things to do. And I know he'll address some of the questions that are here about ear training and online teaching as well. So I'm gonna stop right there. And Mark, I, or uh, uh, Doc, I'm gonna uh, have to figure out uh, <laughs> what that piece is that you're talking about. Um, but I will work on that and uh, get back to you. So. Uh, the, yeah, I don't Maybe know Graydon Square. I guess I'm gonna have to have to learn this. So, I, I think you'd be a good rapper, Steve. Uh, you are incredible, Steve. And have you thought of writing a book? Have you written a book? Uh, these topics are so close to your heart. 
we need to write you know, I've, I, I should, I've, I've written a book about teaching strings, but I need to write something on this topic, and I'll, I'll give some yeah. thought to that. Yeah. yeah, just beautifully eloquent, even uh, also at the ASTA um, uh, meeting we had two months ago, you were also eloquent about a, a global sensibility responsible of our teachers and our educational system responding to a global sensibility instead of a nationalistic only. And uh, what you're doing is just a great stuff. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Mark. If I, I just want to add real quickly here, just to reinforce that, you know, we've held music camps for many years in Ukraine in the summers, yes. and we're not going to be able to go this summer, right? But we've got a team of Ukrainian teachers that we've been training, and that's what we are all interested in here in this room right now is duplicating ourselves, investing in other teachers. And I just want to, again, thank you for doing that. But I also, I have a project in Zambia, and my, my field director in Zambia wrote to me yesterday, goes, Steve, we are just thinking about America every day. He said, we are so dependent on America, and we so need America for our own survival. And for them, his, his, his most important of the day is his four-hour church service on Sunday mornings when they sing and dance and make music, and everybody in the congregation does that. Nobody is not a musical. Everybody sings. There's no audience. The, aud the congregation is the choir. Mm. So I just, we are part of a big world. And as we saw coronavirus spread, man, th let's do that with music. Yes, and that is such a great message because we see our composers, Mahler's Second Symphony, um, uh, the Beatles with uh, Let It Be. Um, we can list the music that we all get shivers and chills from that we don't yeah. understand. How did Beethoven come up with the, the Ninth Symphony? Stuff right. like that is unbelievable. And to share that with other cultures, but also recognizing their culture as valuable as much as Mahler's, Beethoven and Brahms, and Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles. I mean, these, the Ukrainian culture is magnificent. <laughs> All of these cultures have such great contributions that we cannot push aside as irrelevant. And thank you, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Wonderful. We've got three awesome teachers. Uh, so, Deb, um, sh uh, we'll do the questions. Uh, I, I, are they yeah, piling I up have, as questions? <laughs> I have several questions at the end that are real, that are probably more general as far as wanting to hear from lots of different people. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that, that the, all the panelists, because I know a couple of them may have to leave, that um, y'all no, look worry. at the comments that people are making because they are making wonderful comments about the things that y'all are saying. So they're not questions so per se, but just you know agreeing with the things that y'all are saying. Yes. So make sure that y'all check that out if y'all have to leave before the end. Bye, Bob. Yes, yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bob. Right. Bye, David. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So, so Corey, let's start with you because, uh, you know, again, I see you as that generation that just refuses to do it any other way but your own way. And that, to <laughs> me, is where the action is, man. And you've created fingerprints and your signature on your great program to the point where in the next couple of years, this will be one of the revered programs along with uh, Clara's and Heather's program. So join us, Corey. Good to see you. Hey, how are you guys doing? Great. Well, I'm sorry I was late to the, the session here. I had a, a live class with my kids. Uh, we had uh, one of our local orchestra college directors was in talking to the kids about practicing and and this very topic kind of came up, just the kids were asking about uh, Paganini and, and its relevance to what they're playing today. And then some kid asked if it's, if it's overdone or if it's, um, its relevance is overstated. And we said, no, absolutely not. Like, you've got to still play classical music. That's the music that's teaching us the great technique that we can play on our instruments so we can play any genre of music. And then we also were talking about um, the difference between practicing and playing and that the kids should be spending, yes, spend time practicing. You know, when, you know, you got the teacher, you're working on a piece of music and you're drilling it and you're going home and you're working on and trying to perfect, you know, those four bars of music, really going and, and honing in on that and practicing, but also spending time playing, playing the kind of music that you're listening to or the, whatever you're interested in. Um, my 
my philosophy and my approach to teaching at, at my school has been trying to find ways to reach the kids at least halfway, if not more, to where they're at. Uh, I am trying to incorporate contemporary music, rock, pop, dubstep, whatever they're listening to on the radio into what we're doing in our classroom. I even do this in our traditional orchestra classroom. We may be working on classical rep, but we're using modern technique and tools to to work on that. So like we do our our technical warm ups every day. I never skip that. But I like to do it with a drum beat instead of the metronome. Kids kids do not like the sound of the metronome. I don't know of anyone that really does. It's annoying. <laughs> Um, but it's much more fun to play with a drum track or some kind of background track than it is to some annoying beep. Uh, so I, I use that a lot with the kids. Uh, I think out there, string players have kind of had this reputation of playing with bad rhythm, especially young string players. And I think it's because they don't have a rhythm section like the band kids do. They've got this huge percussion rhythm section behind them and it kind of forces you to, to play rhythm, rhythmically in time. So if you provide that rhythm section for them, it's, it's a lot easier to, to get them to, to do that. I saw a question earlier, they asked about um, activities for ear training. I think ear training is something you should be thinking about even before you give them the instrument. I start with calm response, sing back after me before they even get an instrument in their hands. Cause often that first week they don't have, not every kid has an instrument yet. So you gotta do, that's your opportunity to, to start to teach those oral skills, uh, whether it's clapping back a rhythm or singing pitches, uh, but not, don't stop there. Like continue singing each day um, as part of my warm up process, it's, you know, we do a lot of call and response. Either I sing, they sing, or I play, you play. Uh, and then, you know, taking that to the next level, you know, by the end of their eighth grade year, being able to take a solo that they heard on a Rolling Stone song and, and transcribing it or, or a melody, vocal melody they, they're hearing on the radio. The kids are like, can we learn that song? Like, you know, why don't you go home and see if you can figure out that melody? I bet you can. And they sit at home with that song, listening to it, no sheet music, and they're able to figure that out. Um, so I think teaching kids to be able to learn music without sheet music is, is very, very necessary. Just to ditto what some other people have been saying in the session so far. Um, I don't want to repeat information other people have said, um, but, you know, just using what the kids are interested in and incorporating and infusing it into music is going to help us in the long run. And the attrition rate uh, is a very interesting thing to look at because when I first started teaching, that was one of the first things I noticed is uh, I would have a lot of kids start at the beginning, but you would see this huge drop off. And especially if you look from sixth grade to 12th grade, the amount of kids you started with to the amount of kids you end up with is very different. Um, so I've been trying over the last several years of my teaching to kind of keep track of that and see if I can get that number to be higher. And I think providing these really exciting, engaging opportunities for them and performance opportunities is a way to keep them around. Um, and performing often. I think some people yeah. wait too long to do performances. They'll go months and months without a performance and it's hard to stay motivated. I know I wouldn't be able to keep practice, practicing the same music for months without a performance. So I think the frequency of performance is also really important. Thank you, Corey. Corey, I'd like to add one thing which I find to be an interesting um, part of the teachers who are on the sidelines. Um, you do not lose control of your classroom. Oh, I'm going to bring it. Oh, this kid, they're playing blues over there. They're doing country music over there. Oh my God, it's chaos. It's nothing like that. You are far more in control by allowing them to control it too. You're yeah. still, it's still your classroom. It is not a free for all. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's really important that you said that because Yes, you're you're giving up control, but not really. Like you're you're there supervising. You're, you're the adult presence, but they're the ones driving what's happening. You have to be able to let them just go off in the wild 
and explore on their instruments or, or right. any and type you're, of music. You're hovering. You're, you're hovering yeah. because if a kid keeps playing the same wrong note, you got to, hey, by the way, Billy, that note is actually a B flat, not a B. Oh, thank you. Now I'm playing it right. So there's the oversight and, of, and the teacher relationship with the student is as disciplined as anywhere in time with music pedagogy. You're still creating that. But what you're doing is you're not as visible. Yeah. I guess that's a way of saying it. But thank you. We adore you. And what you're doing is incredible. And you're just beginning. And uh, Clara is also a absolute absolute leader uh we had the pleasure of working with your you guys before all this craziness happened and it's just so great to have you with us please share what your thoughts are and your experiences well thank you thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel um some things that i've experienced uh i know a lot of our speakers have spoken about bringing folks in like mark wood or other uh professionals you know, they can teach the kids things that are not really in our toolbox. Um, most of us go through, you know, our music ed training and it's basically classical all the way. Um, and that's where I felt my comfort. You know, I grew up in a house with musicians, but my brother and sister, they loved rock music. Um, but I was so focused on trying to get to the next level of my own playing. I really gave it no um, time, you know, and interesting now that's mainly what I listen to rock and pop and other things trying to reach my students um, but when I went out into the classroom I was finding you know at the beginning my program grew over five about five five and a half years I took it from uh, it went from 38 students across eight schools up to close to 200 kids and I just got to the point where the students by the time and I had fifth grade through 12th grade by the time they got into ninth, 10th grade, they were ready to start exploring other things. And um, interestingly, that same year, I was doing a Trans-Siberian piece for the Winter Parade. Called a friend, I wanted some uh, electric instruments because I wanted my kids to march. And anyway, long story short, I got in contact with Mark Wood and you know he allowed me to use some of his instruments and said, would you like me to come and work with your kids? And I was just floored. I was like, whoa, somebody of his caliber wants to come and work with my kids. And it was the change of my program. Uh, that year we had already done registrations for the following year. I was losing a lot of kids. They're wanting to go to swimming and different um, electives. Once Mark came in, I did not lose a single student, but they also went and got their friends because it reached them. It touched their spirit. Um, and they're like, hey, can we do some more music like this? And I just got to the point where I was like, tell me what you want to play. And we started doing more things by ear because quite frankly, for myself, it was my scary point. I'm not, I was not good at improvisation or playing by ear, um, you know, especially on the spot. So we played a lot of games like that. Um, the next year, my program continued to grow as well. Um, now bringing Mark Wood, after I did my uh, graduate work, I brought him to Tallahassee. And the difference in my students since he was there in January has been so fascinating. Uh, a couple weeks later, I had a Saturday workshop. Uh, it was a tech workshop with my students, just getting to work with um, different software. They were wanting to do some recording. And uh, there were five kids there and they said, okay. So they laid down the baseline and they were just trying to figure out what worked best. They got some things laid down and was, uh, said, you know, why don't we add some lyrics to this? And just on the spot, they kept adding to it. And it was interesting because this is not how they were before. Um, the skills that Mark has are not my strong suit, but it empowered them to reach outside of what we've been doing in the classroom. Um, it's challenged me to even become better, uh, you know, because it's so easy to get lost in what we've been doing. And we know that, so we just keep going back to what we know. Um, but the kids have really soared. And we're currently now during our distance learning, they're creating their own songs, putting them in acapella. So uh, I call them their one man band projects. Some of them are just phenomenal. You know, kids, when we allow them and we give them some kind of parameter, they begin to explore in a way that 
uh, I would have never done, you know, but to give them some freedom, taking off the restraints and letting them play. Um, I'm seeing creativity from them that I had not seen all year. Um, so anyway, I, the thing that I keep going back to is, especially right now, a lot of my colleagues and I have been speaking about, you know, we're not able to go out and do our typical recruiting that we do to make sure we have our numbers and things like that. Um, but I think it's important that we stay connected with our students, even through this distance learning. Um, I have found that the students, they will do Zoom calls and just to chat with each other and they'll run a rehearsal. Um, they've come up with their own little ways to you know, make things happen. Um, but it has been phenomenal to watch them grow even while they're not in class together. Um, so for those that are watching that have never had Mark in or David Wallace, I've never had a chance to have you in, but you know, bringing folks that do not do, you know, that have skills that we do not maybe have, um, but bring them in because to bring in an expert, it also gives our students somebody else to look up to that they may be able to identify with more than myself. Mark is way cooler than I am. Um, <laughs> <you know? laughs> so when he comes in, it's just like, Not yeah, true. Dr. Not, she's, uh, you know, we'll go after Mark, but um, just keeping the kids inspired. And I think us as uh, teachers is to continually learn and uh, really get closer to the kids and, um, also, like Corey was saying, let's find what they're listening to. And Dr. Gillespie was talking about that as well, is really doing what the kids are wanting to do. And the last couple of weeks, the projects the kids have been sending in to me, phenomenal. And I've been learning about new pieces and uh, new groups. So anyway, that's, uh, thank you. Oh, well, Clara, let's be real clear about all, all, everyone on this panel and throughout the world. We are basically all musicians. You're a great musician. David's a great musician. Corey, we're all musicians. Right. And no one's better than ever. We have our strengths and weaknesses. I do too. I am a terrible fiddler. I cannot fiddle at all. Um, but if you want me to do Hendrix, I can do that really easily. So it's just certain things that pull my heart to uh, my expression specifically, there's no way that you're gonna express music like I can, and there's no way that I can express the way you play music. So we are all the same on this, and we're all, that's why I really wanna make sure that our teachers understand that we're not just teachers, colleagues, and we're not just fit, uh, violin players, fiddlers, jazzers, we're musicians. And we need to show the world as musicians that we can come together, the fiddle world with the jazz world, the rock world with the classical world, Everything does this, not like this. It's a handshake that we need to do. And the students who witness the teachers who are flexible with that grow into more diverse type of thinking. Right. That is where, because what percentage, everybody, and use your fingers, because I can use, how, what percentage of your string students turns into the next Joshua Bell? I'll put a half finger up. I, right? I mean, it, so our, if our goal is not to develop the next Joshua Bell, and by the way, if your kid is, they're at Juilliard Prep living in an apartment in New York, and that kid's going through that very, very closed vacuum that requires to be training to be an, a, an, a virtuoso Tcha, a Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto competition winner. That's an athlete. We're not talking about that, and that's such a small percentage of it. And your students, uh, Clara Corey's and Heather's students, I don't look at them, oh, this is the next Rostropovich. Oh my goodness, you have to play this way. No, 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 no. Who are you and how, what's your personality? What are you feeling that expresses you as a person first? And you guys do it so well. Um, thank you, Clara. Heather Gonzalez leaving the best for last. Um, I can't imagine how many comments are up and whoever's still watching this, thank you. I wanted this to be a lot looser than the uh, ASTA presentation, which we only had 60 minutes for. Heather, it's so good to see you. We adore you and what you have done in the last seven to eight years is astounding. Talk to us. Okay, so again, not to try and um, to repeat my to repeat what's already been kind of said. So I'm gonna jump in uh, on a question that I saw um, on the live. Um, people were asking about lack of funds and also from my experience too, um, yeah. when we're starting, when you start something new like this, let's see, you have anything in your district that's outside the box like this, you are going to get some pushback, maybe from other teachers, students, parents, your administrators, 
and kind of how to kind of work your way through that as, as well as, you know, funding. Um, so I said the biggest thing when I, when I started teaching, um, I came from a different background. I was classically trained, but I had actually wanted to completely quit and break my violin into a million pieces because I got so burned out in college. Um, but fortunately, I got um, adopted by a mariachi group, and that changed my life. Again, talking about alternative styles and kind of what I learned from that experience, I've wanted to always kind of offer that to my kids so that they have all those opportunities. Um, so biggest thing for me, just touching base with you all I've talked about was getting kids off music um, and through these styles, also teaching kids to step away from the music stand and actually look at people and have those moments. And I've seen a huge change, not only in my numbers, but I think in, in developing student leaders and making students grow, become more confident in all different aspects of their life. I've seen that um, giant. And also in regards to, um, I am a Title I campus um, and we have over 85% over um, where students have like free and reduced lunches. Um, so the biggest thing in our area and some parts of our district are, are definitely much more wealthy um, that our numbers are continuing to grow in comparison to those schools, but also that our students are equitable in, in the fact that um, without private teachers, they're playing at the same level as these other students. They are playing with passion. They're learning all these things from these different styles um, and from thinking outside the box. Uh, now jumping back, I guess, to um, how to find money and how to find support for these programs. Um, again, thinking outside the box, the biggest thing that I did was getting to know my community and it was going to work um, and get them excited because originally parents would just drop off their students and not come to concerts. Half the kids wouldn't come to the concerts. Um, so making more like for my concerts, making it a really big deal. I know Corey does a great job of that too, with like lights and doing, you know, glow concerts, whatever we can do to be outside the box um, with our new exciting music to get the community excited. Um, that was the, the first thing that really happened. And then parents got excited. And when the administrators see that your cafeteria is completely full of standing room only, oh, you want some money? Sure, we'll give you some money. Um, those are the things that really help. Um, again, like let's say uh, creating um, opportunities too, like performances like Corey was mentioning, you want your kids to perform as much as possible, especially in the community. So again, like uh, everyone knows you do have an orchestra program and what you're doing. So many times uh, I was like, well, let's create a Cinco de Mayo festival on our campus just so that the group had an opportunity to perform and that the whole school would be there, um, you know, in including things like that. Um, in regards to, I guess, money that someone who was asking about too and how to fund something like this. Um, the biggest thing, and I'm like kind of a shy person. I know, Doc, you, you get me there. I don't um, believe that. <laughs> um, I had to really push myself out of the box and ask. And that was the hardest thing for me, but asking like to bring Mark to my program eight years ago, we didn't have the funds at all. No one was gonna support it. My administrator wasn't on board at the time. Um, my parents weren't on board. So I asked music stores in the community and they're the ones who funded it and they helped us. Um, and over time that's continued, um, even just like asking again, like musicians and going out or, or asking if your kids can um, maybe go to a sound check of some great like performers that are coming to town. If you ask, all they can do is say no, you know, and that I think was huge. And that really helped get my kids excited um, and get my administrators excited um, when we had these things going on. Um, and now after all these years working with Mark, um, my fine arts director is completely sold on this idea. Um, a lot more of our teachers in our district are excited about this, especially the Title I schools, and we're seeing growth in our programs for those who are doing these alternative and eclectic styles and having this kind of buy-in. Um, and so now our district is funding every year, except for this year, obviously, um, every year we have a thousand string students who do a huge giant concert. All the music is memorized. We have choreography for all the kids. Um, and it becomes this huge show for parents and for the community um, so that they know, you know, the orchestra students were pretty awesome and we rock just as hard as any other discipline. And kind of to go tie into that a little story. Um, when I first started teaching, we were uh, performing for, you know, the elementary schools for recruitment and a parent came up to me and said, you know, I would have chosen bands because they're loud. And I was like, 
Oh, you want loud? Here, hold my rosin. We're going to do something different here. Okay, you know, so the following year, we brought in all our amps and we were playing different stuff, you know, and that made a huge difference. But I mean, that's, that's the thing that people still think, you know, orchestra is boring, um, especially again in the community where I am, uh, there isn't a lot of buy-in to classical music. Their parents have never been to an orchestra concert. Right. Um, some of these kids, the only time they've ever been is when the fifth grade takes them to see the symphony the one time and that's it. So why would they want to choose orchestra? Why would they want to stay in orchestra? Um, so it's again, like tying into again, like the music that they like, it doesn't have to be rock. It could be mariachi. It could be Latin. It could be a little bit of everything. Um, but I've seen that's, that's what really has helped grow. Not only my numbers, but I, the schools in my district as well. Uh, Heather, uh, we cannot forget also the deep commitment you have shown in that community despite all the odds against you and i I'm, I'm there every year with you thank you so much i'm honored that you think of me but no matter how many big guns you come in if they're not responding you get bigger guns you just keep doing it and you're relentless and one of the interesting things about our orchestras um, yes, we want them to be aware of the magnificent Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Vivaldi, the Mozart concertos. We, all, we absolutely want them to. But if they don't have a direct connection with them, they will walk by your room and continue walking. Oh, wait a sec. I'm hearing a, a Latin feel in orchestra. So what you're doing is you're actually doing far more than a little bit of the orchestra outreaches. And David Wallace did a lot of great things with the New York Philharmonic. Of course, you're dealing with New York City. Which and and David, just in my right, New York City has like, like the worst or the most challenged or educational programs in the world is in New York City, right? I I'd say it's one of the most uneven. I mean, there's outstanding schools and then there are unconscionably challenging schools. I I think a lot of it is there's um. I, I mean, for the better or for worse, a lot of times how effective education is depends on the government and how things are structured. And so I, the way some states and some districts, there are real serious guarantees that if you're in this district, you're going to get this, 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 and this. And if you're I, not. In, in New York, there, there has always been a challenge that whoever's mayor has a lot to say over what happens, you know, and and sometimes there have been very good standards created by teachers and arts organizations for what an arts education needs to be. And then it's enforced for a while and then someone else gets elected mayor and it changes. And so I yeah, think yeah. that that's partly why none of us can uh, be on the bench when it comes to being politically engaged, vocal, activated. I mean, I'm. I'm really thankful, you know, I remember, I think it was my first or second all-state convention at TMEA in Texas, and they actually got us all together because there was a lawsuit against the state of Texas, which, you know, it basically was trying to seek more equitable distribution of the tax dollars. Mm -hmm. and at its heart, it was a good lawsuit, but the, but, but the unintended consequence would be basically say goodbye to all public school orchestra programs. So they taught us how to write um, letters to our state senator. And that was my first letter to senators. And then I got to Juilliard in 94, and lo and behold, that was when the NEA was under attack mm -hmm. and under assault. And so, you know, once again, so I was trained to be active politically. And so, you know, I'm, I get it, the mailings from the League of American Orchestras and every now and then they're like, hey, write your congressman about this, write your congressperson about this, because it's, you know, it's like th there was a few years ago, they were deciding let's get rid of all charitable deductions on the Schedule A. And, you know, <laughs> there's things that basically impact our livelihood. And if we don't exercise our right to vote, if we don't exercise our political voice, decisions will be made without yeah, us. Steve uh, Benham said that, I mentioned that too, yeah, right? Steve and Bob have both been phenomenal with advocating as well as working with uh, string teachers to educate because it is local. I mean, there's been some interesting questions on the Facebook chat. And yes, by all means, the work you do, reach out locally, work with local artists, work with local businesses. I mean, one of the things that struck me as Heather was saying is, 
one of the keys is collaboration. Every face you see on this panel is a master collaborator where it's so secondhand and second nature that people don't even think about it. I mean, it was last summer at Mark's uh, music festival and camp in Kansas, Corey and Heather Stuten, yeah. uh, students opened for the show that Chuck Bontrager and I had. And it was amazing because, I mean, if you've ever been at Mark's camp or any music camp, you know how it is. You are active from like 8 a.m. to about 11 p.m. And the two of them put their students together, organized a show, choreographed it, put it together in three days with no time. And Chuck and I were in the wings like, oh, God, how do we follow that? Because <laughs> it was it wasn't like, oh, this is nice. This is cute. The kids are doing their thing and playing their strings. It's like, my goodness, this was an amazing show. What are we going to do, Chuck? You know, <laughs> so that collaborative spirit where you just make stuff happen, you know, um, and, and yet the kids are de dedicated. The kids are all in. Man. Yes. They want to show off. And the stu we need more students and orchestras to show show off, man. Stand up and do your Michael Jackson moonwalk while you play the Vivaldi violin concerto. I don't care. But the, the, back to Heather, I can't not think about the impact that you've made and Corey and, and Clara certainly more than, you know, and again, forgive me, the San Antonio Symphony is wonderful. I love them. I'm sure they do a great work by uh, having outreach, but you as a teacher have retained probably more string players in orchestra than they have inspired by they're doing their outreach. And they should bow down to you and continue to be more open to what is that uh, Heather's doing over there? She's got, <laughs> you know, retention. She's got attrition working well for you. What is this? Because the symphony orchestra world and business model is, is just really fragile right now. How do we keep that going? Well, you know what? They should maybe start talking to Heather Gonzalez. And you know, speaking of that, um, this is the year, unfortunately, that uh, I had students that started with me in sixth grade and done EYS every single year, and they're now graduating this year with me as seniors. And, right, and do you think if they, I mean, you were in the middle school, teacher and then they went into a high school program that re didn't really reflect as much of what you're doing how many kids would say ah, i'm out of here well because we have magnet schools in our district so they would right. definitely choose different different schools um and when i did go to the high school we saw that different retention in regards to the students who were really into you know being outside the box and doing different things and i did have to convince those students when i first started because they did come to my office and were like, you know, Miss Gonzalez, we don't want to do this EYS thing. And I was like, you know, one, it's not a democracy. Two, <laughs> <laughs> just give it a chance. And they did. And that one student was Lauren and he won that scholarship that one year. And, and he didn't want to do it at all at first. And it changed his life. Yeah. I mean, it really did. And now I have students who, again, who've done this sixth grade on and they're going to be majoring in music or, you know, yeah. at least going to minor and continue playing in the, the college orchestra, which I think is... Just continuing playing, that's huge. Absolutely, and I think that, that to wind this down, and Deb, you're gonna bring up some questions, but I think that, that I did. <laughs> as we are challenged by the concept of orchestra, the concept of symphony music, the concept of uh, concert halls where we're quiet for you know two hours of listening to Bruckner symphonies, which I can do, um, isn't this a great opportunity for us to look into what Heather and Corey and Clara are doing? Wow. This is what's engaging these kids. Okay, let's not completely change this around. Let's not get crazy here, but maybe we can do a better outreach by having free tickets, because a lot of it's a, a, is a economics with uh, kids to go to orchestra concerts and the communities to really f deal with that. Free concerts, and I really think that we need the return of Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concert Series, where on TV you got some person saying, hey, check this out. This guy's named Hindemith, and he's really cool because Hindemith does this, and listen to how Hindemith, blah, 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 blah. I think that we don't have that, so we're really, and David, I know you're, I can't imagine what uh, one of those board meetings of the New York Philharmonic, that's not a good example. More the, the B-level orchestras where there's not a big support, there's not much money. My brother was in the Syracuse Symphony for 25 years. They went out bankrupt. They just didn't connect with what the community needs for. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna you know uh, compromise everything that we've been working on for hundreds of years. Yeah, but you're out of business. Is that better? 
Is it better that the symphony orchestra is gone than you saying, you know what, let me see if we can collaborate with the community and really do these fun concerts. And orchestras are doing that, but it's a real struggle. Peace and love, guys. Let's see, Deb, did you have any questions? I'm, it's oh all yours. <laughs> I'm not, don't worry. We're almost on two that's hours, usually your, man. I know, but that's usually your sign off. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so let's do a quick round robin sort of thing because people would like to hear some suggestions. Um, one of the questions was um, about ear training and what's your favorite case? So now you can't say call and response because Corey already talked about it. Um, what's your favorite uh, activity to do for uh, ear training? Go. You want Heather? Yeah, let's offer teachers chime in. Right. Heather. And I can't say call and response? Okay. Uh, <laughs> or a twist on it. Or, or you could use a twist on it, not the regular what y'all normally do. Hmm. Um, well, I definitely, I definitely, we do do a lot of call and response, but again, let's say doing it differently, um, having, uh, do it as a group and they could make, you know, two different parts. So people have to take out two different parts, maybe something like that. Um, but definitely, um, you give students opportunities to, each day to be like the, the person who gives the role. And so they're in front of the room opposed to just being the teacher who is giving the call mm. and response. So you know, it also idea. is something that I've been thinking a lot about when I'm listening to uh, uh, progressive rock and the amount of layers. My question to the students would be, what is the tambourine part right there? And they're going to go, what tambourine part? Oh, you're not listening. Listen closely. And what is the hi-hat changing at this point? Or what is the, the orchestration, the cellos? The ch there's no cello part all of a sudden. Why did the composer do that? Get into the mind of the multi-layering that we can do with music that no other art form. Uh, it's like 100 people can play in harmony, but you have 100 people talking at the same time. It's noise. So I think that the multitasking, the multi-levels of the power of music. When I listen to a Beethoven symphony, and you're listening to the triangle part. Why did he put that triangle part there, not flower bars earlier? Stravinsky scores. This is the kind of ear training that we need to kids to listen to the depth of music. So that will bring them to Stravinsky as quickly as it is to Dream Theater, to Yes, to Beatles, to hip hop. There are multi levels of happening to music that are super cool. Uh, yeah, Bob. Okay. So two quick ideas uh, that, that I love doing with kids. Um, one is right away at the beginning, even with your beginners, you immediately start teaching them, okay, D, F sharp, A, pick a note. Okay, good, got that. Let's put a rhythm with it. Now, G, B, D, pick a note. A, C sharp, B, pick a note. Now oh, you yes. take those beginning yeah. tunes and go, okay, let's, let's start. Here we go. You play twinkle, we'll, Russ will play the chords. Go ahead, boom, with the rhythm. Here's the rhythm, go, boom. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Now, we'll start on the, we'll start with the D chord. You figure out when to change. And then let them move them around on different parts, creating rhythm. So you teach them how to do functional harmony. Another great idea is to use, is this is basically ORF, but you take an ostinato. So you take a, like a little bass line, like, Bum, 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 just over and over. Teach them a bass line. Just go here. Play that. Now, good. Over here's here's another lick. Ba da dee dee dee. Bum, 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 bum. You know, and you play that. You play that. You get about three or four of these ostinatos going, and then you bring them as a conductor. You bring them up and down like this, so they have to hear different parts. All of a sudden, this part comes out. That part comes down. Bring it up. Balance it. Now listen to the person next to you. Listen to the section next to you. And then you have you start snapping your fingers. And every two bars, they gotta hear the section next to them, play what they played, and switch to that part. And it keeps going around the, the group like that. And middle school kids will absolutely tear that up. And they I got them to the point where they could literally do five, six, or seven different ostinatos and just keep looping it and hearing what other people were doing. And then just, and then of course, then it's an easy jump in improvisation, but it's a great RL skills thing. Play, yeah. be playing and listen to something and figure it out while you're playing. But just awesome. keep it short. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Steve. 
Um, for the really beginning level kids, uh, I suggest if you've got a tune that, you know, is a simple tune, it moves in 2-4, put it in 3-4 and swing it. If the tune is in major, put it in minor. If it's in minor, put it in major. And just get those kids instead of, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, bum, 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 change the rhythm on it, change the meter on it. Mm. And then the like, same thing with the tune, you know, uh, uh, hot cross buns or whatever you're teaching, put it in minor and, and have those kids go back and forth and then learn the baseline for that. And you've got an arrangement that they can absolutely play at home themselves. Uh, just uh, the first time through, let's do it in major and duple. Second time through, let's do it in major and triple. Third time through, let's do it in minor and triple. Fourth time through, let's do it in five eight. I mean, you'll start to see kids really expand their, their vocabulary that way. So from beginning level kids, I like to just that real simple change one note thing, change the harmony makes a, a big. It's a lot of fun. That's a great idea, Debs. Well, one more I, question or? There, well, gosh, we're we're <laughs> coming in on two hours now. And I, I think though, what we're finding is that we do have some questions that could be its own topic. For instance, um, this whole thing that's happening with online and how do you, how do you go online and what do you do? What can you do? Should we, should you, um, should a, a uh, in-person orchestra program incorporate online? Um, all of those kinds of questions are, are coming up. And unfortunately, because we are coming in on two hours, um, I think, you know, we've got a, a definitely a list of, of lots of, of things that we can do again. Um, Maybe uh, can, can check the Facebook and, and respond mm -hmm. personally, if you guys don't mind. I mean, I, I, it, with technology right now, the situation right now, people are starving for information. And I think this is a great opportunity to get the ball rolling. So yeah, so just if y'all would look, because there there are some really good questions about um, about equipment, you know, like what what technology, what kinds of stuff would you would you suggest? Um, for interesting that Heather brought it up, the the problem of the opposite problem. What about the kids who don't want to do anything but classical music? You know right. that there are those programs, and then there are students who are really resistant to that. So it's the opposite of what we've been talking about today. So addressing that, you know, how do you push kids out of their comfort zone for classical music into doing everything that you guys have been have been doing it. So that question came up today, too. So, um, so Heather, I'm glad you brought it up that you had that situation. Um, so, Sorry, so yes, yeah, so great questions. Uh I, I mean, I, I, I'll, I had the same kind of situation with Heather when I first started incorporating this. The, the older kids weren't as into it as the younger kids. I think it's just about building that culture in your program, starting them, start, starting start the stuff the when they're beginners. Yep. Your older kids, yeah, they're pro they might be a little resistant to this. It's, it's change. You know, they're going to be resistant to that. Some will, some won't. Um, you just gotta you gotta stay the course and know that it's it's gonna benefit more kids uh, down the road. Um, and I can't I can't stress enough if you want visibility for your program and you want funding and you want recruitment, you've got to be out in the community. That's where that's where all the help is. Going to your principal and asking for more funding or your district is not really the way to do it because oftentimes, like I know at my school my administration doesn't even have the power or the money to even give you. Um, so going out to the community, performing as many different events as you can, small, large, do it for free. Um, and then it's easier to, you know, go to that city council and ask for some fundings for electric instruments or, or whatever you're trying to get. Um, I'm at the point now, not to say like in a bragging kind of way, but as our orchestra has been out in the community so much, we've kind of developed a reputation around here. They were, we have an online presence and we're out in the community. I have organizations reaching out to me offering to support our program financially, which I'd never thought I would be in that kind of situation. And of course the answer is always, yes, we'll take a donation. And you now uh, have a truck. <laughs> and we, yeah, we have a trailer and, and like $60,000 worth of audio equipment and instruments. It's, but it, 
and it's a slow process. Don't think that it's going to happen overnight. Start small, uh, do, do some fun performances with, with what you have right now and, uh, and then move on from there. Oh, Corey, great guys. And so, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I just wanted to signal. tell everybody that we are, we are going to take some of these suggestions and, and do this again. Um, because I yeah. think this was, everybody is loving what we're taught, what y'all, we're, what y'all are talking <laughs> about and, and want more. So, um, so Let's I want everybody to know that we will, We'll do this again. We'll change topics. We will talk about the things that everybody is really asking for. At I a think later that will be really cool. And David would be great at this. All of us would be is, is us sharing as composers and creative thinkers, how we think and how you can translate that our thinking into a curriculum and pedagogical teaching, which doesn't really exist in the string world. So I want to take David's brain, take it out of his skull and put it in a dish and poke at it Ooh. and see what we can come up some because I, I, David, you, your concerts at my camp and our music festival and your classes, people have created a culture of David Wallace. Am I, I mean, right. I it's think a it was culture. A cult, actually. <laughs> what? A cult, Dali, right. it, oh, they call you the Dolly the do, the... Wally Lama, I think. I, yeah. <laughs> I had nothing to do with any of this, but yeah. <laughs> but look what what is happening when we give a kid some type of example. You're such a great example. They will mirror that. They will mirror that and then create a whole world around that. And it's beautiful to see that because we don't see that with our classical pedagogy people as much. These kids are really like wanting to wear costumes that look like David Wallace. They want to wear t-shirts, anything to get close. And your music, your music, they respond to so deeply. It's so great. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. You all are magical. It was so great. We should visit the, my Facebook. If there are questions, I'm going to spend the next couple of hours going through all of the, uh, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> The teachers are essential workers. Oh, that's a good one, David. We got to put that out. Uh, but anyway, guys, thank you so much. Debbie, thank you. You're always awesome. Oh, thanks. And if anybody has any of it, anything else, we'll stay in touch. Hopefully we can do this soon. Thanks, guys.